Sleeping with the heater on is a good idea to sleep better. Sleep good, sleep good. Hack your sleep suckers. Best friend, Michael Sealer. Tiananmen's one, three years, one month old. Could always see Bitcoin. Good job, Good job, good job. change your career, create a legacy, accumulate more assets, accumulate wealth, plan for the future. You know, if you ask me, before Bitcoin, if you ask me, how are you going to create or, or fund your foundation for the next hundred years? I'm going to say something like, I guess I give all my money to Wall Street and I'll hire some good money managers. And 70 years from now, the grandson of someone that I hired today might go to college, figure out what to do, and, and day trade or shuffle my money around so I don't lose it. And I, that's the best idea. It's not a good idea, right? Like, that's how the Rockefeller's do it, right? But, but you know, the, what you'll see is that 100 years after someone actually accumulates some wealth, the, the money's generally gone 99% of the time. And what Bitcoin offers the family is the ability to actually plan for your great-granddaughter and think that maybe there'll be some support for them. And uh, that no one is going to take it from them. Look at uh, the ETFs. What you'll see is that the Bitcoin ETFs are.
falling up past all the commodities. They're about to eat the gold ETFs, and then they're going to eat the S&P 500 index ETFs. And when that happens, everybody's going to take note. Vanguard is going to take note. generating income and that results in them staying relevant right i mean how many people are bragging about their you know new gold etf right it's not relevant it's not relevant um you want to be a leader right the people that we that we look to are the people that were that, that discovered or, or created google and apple and microsoft and they create the next airplane and you know, they, they put Starlink in the sky and they give us internet and they give us the next phone, right? Be relevant, be a leader. These companies want to be leaders, right? You won't find a CEO that says, my aspiration is to be viewed as, as a follower and late to the next great thing. And they all want to create shareholder value, right? You can't create shareholder value by shrinking. And so that takes us to operating companies. It's the same thing. But operating companies, for the most part in the world, are like type 1 diabetics. I, I had 100 competitors over 20 years. They all failed. There's a 99% mortality rate with these companies, right? You look at the number, and you're like, well, I don't know 300 million companies. That's because they're failing millions every single month. They're all failing all the time. Why are they failing? They can't store energy. They can't harness capital, right? What does Facebook do? They give all their capital back to the shareholders in a dividend and a buyback. What does Apple do? They give their capital back in a dividend and a buyback. They take on debt. How do companies fail? They leverage up. They take on debt. What happens when you fail? Well, instead of, I used to say to people, well, we have 500 million in capital. We could go for 40 quarters. We'd go for 10 years and not make any money and we'll still be in business. It's like you could go for 10 years and not eat and still be alive. That's indestructible. On the other hand, when you give all the money back and you borrow a billion dollars, well, in that case, you end up with a debt covenant and you have to generate $27 million this quarter. And if you generate $26 million this quarter, if you miss by one 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 thousandth of your capital structure if you
this by 0.1%, you actually trip all the debt covenants and the bank owns you. You're technically, you're technically in violation of your, of your debt. They can call the loan, you're insolvent. So think about the difference between you starving to death if you miss one meal versus you starving to death when you haven't eaten for the year. Okay, that's the difference between having capital and having no capital. The status quo in the world today is we tell people you can't keep capital in an operating company because all of the uses, all the, the liquid capital is diluted and it doesn't beat the capital. Bitcoin solves the problem. You can harness capital, you can grow your revenues, you can beat inflation for the first time. You know, there's the Magnificent Seven are good investments. The other 493 companies are not because the other 493 companies cannot beat inflation because beating inflation means raising, increasing your cash flow 8% every year forever or more like raising... Your price is 10% a year forever. Who can do that? A digital monopoly, a company with no cost, with monopoly pricing power. How many of them are there in the world? Your fee is 10% year over year forever. Monopoly pricing, comma, zero operating cost. There's like one in 10,000 companies that you would know of and one in a thousand public companies. Okay, so these companies, the ones that you might be afraid of, they're not winning, right? They're struggling the same way. Bitcoin is a lifeline for them that you can think of them as wage slaves in the same way that you are a wage slave. Everybody is working, having to get 10% more every year just to keep ahead of inflation. It's just theirs is in revenue and cash flow. And so what does Bitcoin offer them? It wage slave, comma, revenue and capital. Extended lifespan. You see a CEO and you say, well, are you going to adopt Bitcoin? He says, why should I? I say, well, and extend your lifespan. Might keep your company from going bankrupt in 10 years. It might, it, it might allow you to continue to do business and serve your customers for the next 100 years. How many companies are 100 years old? Not many. I'll ask you another question. How many famous education institutions with endowments are 100 years old? Most of them. Why is it that universities last 100 years and companies don't? No capital. That's why. You think anybody goes in business wanting to die? Do you think they want to have their company fail in 12 years or 6 years or 25 years? No, they're stuck in a system. Right? They're stuck in a traditional system that makes them do this. Banks have the same issue. They want to attract and retain capital. They want to decrease risk. You know, you could say, well, you know, the bank is beholden the central bank. Well, here's another vis vision. What about 100,000 banks that are all tapped in the Bitcoin network and they don't have to worry about the Bitcoin network shutting them down? Right? When a bank joins Bitcoin, it becomes systemically robust, much more anti-fragile. This is a benefit, right? They would like to find a way to do this. This will decrease your earnings, let them create shareholder value, let them delight their clients. They have a billion customers, they have corporations, they need to serve them. All of these companies, all of these nonprofits, they all need the bank to support what they do. In time they will. The nonprofits 
are also going to benefit. They want to raise capital, but also they have endowments. They want their endowments to go up 40% a year, not go up 4% a year. Right? There's nobody running a church, a charity, a benefit, a school that'll say, we don't want our endowment to appreciate and we don't want an endowment. This allows them to harness technology. This allows them to extend their reach globally. You know, Bitcoin is money that's global and it's got a half-life of forever. All of these, all of these endowments, they're using money that has a half-life. Life of 10 years or five years, your property might have a half life of 20 years. Their investments are short duration. Their investments are local, right? Their property is local. So Bitcoin stretches your scope across time and space. Now tell me what charitable pursuit doesn't want to do more? They all do. Right? You won't find anyone that, that says, oh, we just want to be out of business in three years. So Bitcoin's the solution to nonprofits. And for governments, traditionally people have thought, you know, well, the government doesn't like or won't embrace Bitcoin. But you know, they will embrace Bitcoin because Bitcoin provides them with the financial power to thrive in the 21st century. And there's no, there's no government on earth that doesn't appreciate the power of money. Right? This will allow them to lower taxes, it will allow them to strengthen their currencies, defend their... All governments like money. Who doesn't want to last forever? Question mark. Sovereignty. Improve their economies. Join the global community and delight their citizens. for you, ask what you can do for Bitcoin. Bitcoin needs you. That's the reason, if you're wondering why you're here, you're here because Bitcoin needs you. And, and my deepest hope is when you leave, you'll leave empowered, inspired, and enabled to go do good for Bitcoin wherever you go back to two after you leave Madeira. I can't stress this enough. Everyone you encounter is an opportunity to improve the world by gaining their support for Bitcoin. Your customers, your employees, your boss, your investors, your clients, the mayor, the, the coach on the team, the parents at the at the PTA meeting, the teachers of your kids, the doctor at the hospital, your dentist, everybody you run into is an opportunity. And what we can do collectively that'll make the biggest difference is spread to people, right? The knowledge of Bitcoin is like, if you knew that drinking dirty water would kill you, you would tell people you love to stop drinking it. If you knew antibiotics could save their life, you would tell them about your experience. When it comes to this, and we, we, I've got the orange pill here, and we talk about orange pilling, but, but I break it down in, uh, in two different cycles, right? First of all, everybody you meet has an intellectual perspective on Bitcoin, okay? And they're going to click through these five gears. The first perspective is denial. Bitcoin is a scam, it's tulip bulbs, it doesn't exist, 
It's a ghost, a mirage, a pyramid scheme. And if we convince them that, you know, I would show them a picture of all the Bitcoin miners in the world and say, oh, you look, there's like hundreds and hundreds of data centers burning more gigawatts of electricity than the U.S. Navy. This is not a scam. This is the most powerful computer network in the world. And we want to get them from denier to skeptic. The skeptic. The most powerful computer network in the world. Because money is involved, question mark? Because, okay, I get it. Bitcoin may be a good thing, but it's too good to be true. The government's going to ban it. You hear that a lot. Okay, it's good. I get it. But someone's going to take it away from you, the skeptic. And what you have to then show is, well, if the government was going to ban it, they wouldn't be bragging about having captured three billion of it and selling it in the open market, right? Nor would they have approved the ETFs, nor would they be fighting over who gets jurisdiction over it, right? And we need to move you from denier to skeptic. And then the next step, we take the trader. Okay, well, maybe I guess I might be able to sell it. I don't, you know, I'll buy it if it's going up, I'll sell it if I think it's going down. And then hopefully they get to that next level investor. Bitcoin is great technology, just like Google, just like Apple, just like Microsoft, just like water and electricity, cars and planes are great technology. It's technology. It's the future. I should invest in it. You made a lot of money on the Magnificent Seven. How do you not own Bitcoin? Do you not believe in the Magnificent Seven? Do you think semiconductors won't make a difference? You don't believe in artificial intelligence? They have the same cycle, by the way. Once we get them to invest, or the last step intellectually is Bitcoin is an instrument of economic empowerment. I have Jack Proxy's here. I give him a shout out. Jack Proxy put that in my head. By the way, don't get, don't get dejected that someone may actually be a denier. You know who was a denier? Me. And you know what I became next? A skeptic. And then at some point, I looked and I said, you know, the world's kind of messed up and interest rates are zero and my dollars are generating zero. I'm going to buy Bitcoin. I became a trader. And then after I bought the Bitcoin, I started like, reading a lot more and listening to a lot more podcasts and thought about it. And I realized, no, I should be an investor. I would say when I got in there, when you started hearing about me, I was kind of at the investor stage. But it was everybody in this community and every, every Bitcoin podcaster and every writer and every educator that collectively got me over the line to becoming a maximalist, where I said... You're never going to see a collection of people like this at, a, at an Apple investor conference or at a Google investor or Microsoft investor or NVIDIA investor conference or a gold investor conference. This is very special. I like the orange. I'll marry the orange. Um, when you're orange belly right? You're working people intellectually, but it's also spiritual. And they all start as observers. It's all the people writing about Bitcoin on Twitter, and they observe it. And then they become participants, and then they start to actually buy and build on it. And maybe they are 100%. of my portfolio is liquid and my rest of my wealth is in my house. And so they go and they start to put a bunch of their liquid wealth into Bitcoin because they're believers. And then at some point, you get to be hardcore and I'll call you an adherent. But then you're like all in. It's like the only thing I want to invest in. I'm not saying you got to sell all your chairs. Just the ones you don't need. This is a spiritual journey, and then, and then at the final point, you become an advocate. And when you're an advocate, it's not just your own, you want to go tell other people. 
You want to convince your company, your charity, your church, your government, your family, you're an advocate. So think of this as a, as a continuum, and we're working together to move people from the lower left quadrant, you know, denier, observer, they're going to say, well, don't talk to me about Bitcoin. They know about it, but they don't talk about it. And you move to the upper right quadrant, you know, you're a maximalist and you're an advocate. And, uh, you know, and, and you don't necessarily just stay there. We all got to work together to keep ourselves motivated to be in that quadrant because it can be, you know, what I was leaving was Bitcoin grows Bitcoin, right? When, when people are talking crap about Bitcoin, we're winning. When they're not sure about Bitcoin, we're winning. When they're liking it, we're winning. When they're debating something, we're winning, right? Bitcoin grows stronger. And um, I posted this yesterday. It's like Bitcoin. Everyone who says the word, quote, Bitcoin, end quote, comma, the network grows stronger.
Facebook initial IPO stock price and now. to invest in it, comma, and now, comma, almost 12 years later, comma, it has increased by over a factor of 10x question marks.
think you know, that we're even about the idea from ancient Indian philosophy and manuscript karma. And also interestingly enough, I thought that he also likened and talked about the Spartans and how they controlled the Helot racers. How is it that 5,000 Spartans can control a Helot population of 10 million?
trust comma trusting the stability of something question mark 